Okay, here we go. Okay. So Robin, Linda, thanks for joining us this evening to go through Project Anero and our results of the project over the last roughly 10 weeks. Um, my name is Brian Taubenheim. We'll be doing introductions for the whole team, but I'll kick us off and go through the agenda and then allow the rest of the team to introduce themselves. So on slide two, we have a this high level agenda. Be doing some introductions, as I mentioned. Uh, Bill will go through the project goals and evaluation of the mar marketing initiatives. Um, I'll jump back in and talk a little bit about the modeling that we did. Um, Frank is going to present the sales dashboard that we developed, and then Sean's going to talk about the mobile application. Uh, feel free to ask questions at any time. I know it's, sometimes it's difficult over video, and maybe we'll talk over each other, but um, just you know, ask questions as we go. And uh, at the end, we'll wrap up with just a overview of the deliverables of the project and our recommendations moving forward. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Good. Slide three, the project team. Uh, as I mentioned, Brian Taubin, I'm the project manager. Uh, background is uh, technical backgrounds originally in chemistry. Also have an MBA, spent 20, years in the pharma and fine chemical world and uh, just moving over to do incorporate more of the data analytics into that field and expand my field a bit. Bill? Yeah, it's uh, Bill Bass. I do direct marketing and sell clothes and do some market research stuff. Frank? I'm Frank Ratton. I've got an accounting background and quality process improvement, and I currently work for Hub International in Chicago. Sean? And as for me, uh, Sean Bourgeois, I have a product background, uh, mostly in internet software companies and uh, to a certain extent mobile applications. And uh, also, as similar to Brian, I have an MBA uh, in terms of an education and background. Great. So, no, Robert and Linda, if you could give us a little bit on your background. Yep. Uh, I'm Rob Banky. I am. I sell clothes. I'm trying to sell a lot more clothes. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> uh, I'm Linda Severson. I run a one of Bill's companies, and uh, I've worked with uh, Fair Indigo since its inception on and off, and I'm here to try and help him sell coals. Great. Thanks. All right, we'll move right into it. So I'll turn it over to you, Bill, for project goals on slide four. Sure. Uh, so big things, uh, kind of three major things that we tried to do uh, with this project. So one was to figure out uh, your marketing, what's what works for you and what hasn't worked for you in terms of marketing effectiveness. Um, and then recommend any things that we think you should change your strategy, um, things that you could do better, uh, particularly around some of the uh, fall catalog tests uh, that were done around bounce back catalogs and um, uh, postcards, the thank you postcards. And then get into modeling on the catalogs mailing out to figure to understand could we look at what happened in Q4 of 2017, what you actually did with your mailings, mm -hmm. go back and say based on what we knew going up into Q4, could we build predictive models that would have done a better job of determining who your potential buyers were versus not, and, and particularly try and figure out a way to reduce the number of catalogs that are getting mailed. Um, and so we'll go through through each of those. Uh, the other thing we did was develop a dashboard uh, that ties into your uh, kind of key marketing metrics that would make it easy for you to see things that were going on. Uh, we used Tableau for this. Uh, and so Frank will take you through some of the kind of G whiz features of Tableau and, and uh, present a dashboard. And then you can give us feedback on whether you think uh, that dashboard would be uh, good for you, not good for you, how you tweak it, uh, things like that. And then finally, Sean built a really cool mobile app uh, that uh, would potentially be used in a pick, pack, and ship environment um, to determine what marketing material should go in the box with the uh, with an order. And Sean will do a demonstration on that. 
and then we'll end up uh, take whatever questions, but ask questions as you go as we go along because we're going to be in different segments. And so if you wait for all your questions at the end, we'll be kind of jumping back to earlier segments. So it's kind of I think it's going to be an easier flow if you ask as we go along. Um, so it's starting off at the bottom of the slide, and we showed you this slide back when we uh, reported our initial findings to you. So over on the left, uh, we have the average order value by uh, by channel, and as you guys have known all along, our Amazon customers spend about half what our phone and web customers uh, spend. But if you take that to the next level down and you say, okay, within each of those categories, are there some clusters of customers that are more valuable and some cluster clusters that are less valuable? You'll see over on the right uh, where we've taken each of those channels, Amazon phone and web, and split them out by did they buy Fair Indigo branded product? Did they buy Jubal's branded product? Or did they buy other brands, typically being uh, gift brands? And what you can see on that one is that while Amazon in aggregate has the lowest average order value, customers that buy Fair Indigo on Amazon have $112, $113 average order value. So you're up there with our web customers and our phone customers in that case. Um, and then across the board, you know, the, the blue uh, bars are the Fair Indigo. You can see the Fair Indigo in every channel. If we get Fair Indigo, if we're selling Fair Indigo product, uh, that channel does very well in terms of average order value. Um, and then the Jubal's and the other brands typically are lower, although it's interesting through the phone, Jubal's actually exceeds the other brands, which it doesn't in the other two, two mm -hmm. categories. So any questions on that setup, Rob or Linda? And the Amazon was Amazon only. This would have been, we use channel max spend is what determined Amazon, what is determined by channel. So there were two, there were two channel um, flags in the data. One was channel of last order. And then what? Then one was channel of max spend. So where did they spend the bulk of their money? Uh, it turns out that the vast majority of these uh, orders are the same of these customer IDs. If your channel max spend, you, you very rarely have a different channel max spend and a different channel last order. They're almost identical. I think if, uh, Brian, am I right? There were like six, six customer ID numbers yeah. that very, very few. Yeah. yeah. They're almost redundant fields, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Bill, I, I can't remember what these, when you showed this to me initially, but did you end up backing out the on the phone the wholesale orders, or did, is that still baked into this? So in, in these right here, it was still baked in. I didn't go mm -hmm. back and rerun these. Yep. Um, so there were two things going on. So one, you had the wholesale orders. And then the second was you had the is business right, orders, right. which were different mm -hmm. than the wholesale orders. Right, so right. we backed out the is business, mm -hmm. which would have taken out the wholesale orders plus the other 400 and some yeah. odd that, that were going to business addresses. Right. Um, those orders, and we need to go back and look at that because th those other orders where it's is business was flagged yeah. yes. Uh, mm -hmm. They behave differently than than the rest of the orders. Uh, hmm. So when we were in doing the, 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 it's called exploratory data analysis. When we were in just looking at the data, uh, you could see that the is business uh, flagged accounts behave differently. So hmm. they either actually are businesses or they're, you know, there's something going on with those. That, so we hmm. just took those out. Okay. There are about 60 of those, I believe. No. Okay. 400, 400 of those, 400, 400. yeah, 420 something, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's out of 49,000, so very, very small amount. Yeah. <clears throat> there were 49,000 total customer IDs that we were analyzing. Okay. okay, next page. So the first thing I looked at was the NPR advertising. And we're going to talk a little bit about this as we go along, but there are kind of two two vectors we look at. One is is a difference business significant, right? So if you get uh, two orders and one is a penny more than the other, there's no business significance in that difference. 
The second thing that we look at is statistical significance. So maybe there's a hundred dollar difference between the orders. So it's a business, I mean, it's significant business size, but it might not be a statistically significant difference because it might just be a random occurrence. It's not a, uh, uh, an actual difference between the two. And so uh, I'm gonna start with the business significance because I did that on the NPR advertising and it didn't even warrant looking at the statistical significance. So let me go across the thing. So I first looked at customers uh, and looked at Wisconsin versus the rest of the country. So we know we spent $10,000 for NPR advertising only on Wisconsin Public Radio. So it would have only hit Wisconsin and then whatever leakage around, you know, across the borders if people listen to Wisconsin Public Radio in Minnesota or wherever. Um, and I compared, and because you can't do an A-B test where you said, okay, half the population in Wisconsin is going to hear the ads and half isn't. We did a kind of pseudo A-B test. We took customers in Wisconsin and we compared them to customers in the rest of the continental United States. And what we found was we went, if you look at customers, in Q4 2016, there were 354 customers that ordered from Wisconsin. And in Q4 2017, there were 345. So there was a 2.5% drop year on year. The rest of the country also dropped and it ended up in 3.8%. Uh, so the rest of the country had a bigger drop. And so what I did was I went back and I said, okay, if Wisconsin had 354 customers in 2016 Q4, if we applied the rest of the country's growth or decline, what would it have been? And we came up, I came up with 340. It would have declined from 354 to 340. So you ended up doing better than that. You actually did 345. And so there was a net increase of five customers in Wisconsin over what there would have been from the rest of the country. And so assuming that the only difference was that, uh, was that advertising that was done, we would attribute those five customers to that $10,000 worth of advertising. And that's not a good return. That means we spent $2,000 a customer to acquire these folks. So that didn't work very well. I then went back and I looked at sales instead of customers. And I used that same methodology. So that's the second line, set of lines down where it's under sales. And what we found is while customers went down, sales went up both in Wisconsin and the rest of the country. Sales went up further in Wisconsin than the rest of the country. But the variance that you would attribute to the advertising was $2,300, $1,353. So we spent $10,000 to drive an incremental $2,500 in revenue, which is also not a return on advertising that you want to get. The last thing I did was I looked at uh, Wisconsin versus neighboring states around it. So I did uh, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, uh, Michigan. And said maybe there was a regional, you know, the weather was affecting the, the uh, sales in Wisconsin that might not have affected the rest of the country. And if I took just Wisconsin versus its neighbors, the, almost the exact identical difference that you do with the rest of the country. So it wasn't a weather issue. It was kind of a Midwest. It, was, it wasn't a economic issue just in the Midwest. It was something that, you know, Wisconsin was really no different than the rest of the country or the rest of its neighbors, even with the additional advertising. Any questions on NPR advertising? It's pretty clear. Okay. <coughs> she will save 10,000 bucks. The, you could probably make the argument that, you know, um, we did a blitz. So we did like a, a 30 day heavy rotation, one time thing. <clears throat> you might make the argument that with radio ads, it's better to do like spread that spread that out over more months so people get some repetition over time it's not definitely on the top of our uh, priority but yep. you could probably say that would be something else to look at sometime yeah because you want both reach and frequency and so the right. number of times somebody sees it is important mm -hmm. um and, and i have no doubt that the radio sales reps are going to use that line mm -hmm. 
your all's call. We didn't see any no, I, sales impact based on the ten thousand dollars that was spent. Yeah. So if you spend a hundred thousand, maybe the answer would be that. different. But don't know. No. We did, and just uh, for Linda, for uh, you to know, did we lose Linda, or is she still on the phone? The picture. Oh, her picture's on. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, so I think we lost Linda. She said she might have to pull out because they have a problem going on at work, and so she might come back in. Um, uh, for the rest of you guys, uh, I was talking with Rob. Um, the advertising was actually done in September for the month of September, but when we looked at the just the September numbers, there was weird stuff going on in Wisconsin. Wisconsin sales actually dropped in half. So there was something that happened in 2016 versus 2017 not having to do with the, the radio advertising. So we looked mm -hmm. at the downstream impact in October, November, December, and kind of dropped the, was the September numbers out. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. So as we looked at that one, there wasn't enough business significance to go and look and see if there was a statistically significant difference. Mm -hmm. um, the other ones we did an A-B test on, and I did look at the statistical significant difference on that. And let me kind of take you through what, what we mean when we talk about statistical significance. So let me give you an example. Um, let's say we were at Fair Indigo and we were gonna do a study to determine whether gender was related to height. And so we took a sample and to figure this out. And mm -hmm. we, took, we took our first sample, we picked Ellen and Mary and Stacy and compared them to you, me, and your brother, Michael. Uh -huh. You wouldn't see much gender difference then. Uh -huh. Or if anything, the women might be taller than the men. Okay. In this case. <laughs> yeah, in that case. Now, let's say we took a separate sample. And in that sample, we had Katie, Linda, and Julie Kerbeck. Uh -huh. And we had Don and Bert and Scott. Uh -huh. In that case, you would go, oh, there's a huge uh, gender uh -huh. difference because you know you have a bunch of uh, more petite women, a bunch of tall guys in that sample. Uh -huh. So you're taking two separate samples from the same company uh, and you're coming up with widely different things. And so that can happen with samples is that sometimes you know you, you get a, what's called a margin of error uh, as you go and it get, the margin of error gets better as your population gets bigger, uh -huh. okay? So that's why political polls have a margin of error. They don't know what the actual real number is, but they know it's within this band. Right. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to try to compare two populations and see if their means are within a band that they overlap or if they're far enough separated that you can mm -hmm. be confident that it wasn't just a sampling, you know, random right. sampling problem that, uh, that caused them to be different. Okay, mm -hmm. we good on that? Yeah, I, I'm looking at the column there. I'm thinking I know every from line four down. I don't know any of that, but I assume that's that leads to what you just talked about. It does. We're gonna, <laughs> that's exactly it. So what we have here is we have a holdout group, and then we have customers receiving catalogs, and this is bounce back catalogs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for the holdout group, this is the number of orders in Q4. Yep. And the a holdout group had 1.34 orders, and the customers who got catalogs had 1.45 orders. Okay. So that's including the one they got that generated the test, right? So the one is baked into both groups because they they did one order. That's right? exactly right. Yeah. In order to get in, in order to get a bounce back catalog, you had to have made one order. One order, mm -hmm. and then we put you into either a holdout or a test group, and we the holdout group was about 25 percent. Mm -hmm. the, the so, you know, three out of every four customers coming in would have gotten a bounce back and yep. then the whole you know, one out of four would have been held out and kept kept separate. So what you get down here is uh, you, what you're trying to figure out is how many standard deviations away from the mean these differences are. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the blue thing on the left where I wrote the T statistic. Yes. And it's called a T stat and this is called a T test. Uh, mm -hmm. What you're trying to do is figure out is the one that says T-STAT, which in this case is 2.666, is it greater than or less than the T-critical two-tail, 1.961? Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's bigger. 
but those numbers are kind of hard to, you know, how much bigger, what does that matter? So the more important one to look at or the easier one to look at is the orange box where we mm -hmm. have P. And in order to be statistically significant, P needs to be less than 0 0.5. Okay. And that means that there's a one in 20 chance that it's randomly different. Okay. But there's a 19 in 20 chance that it's for real different. That's at okay. P equals 0 0.05. Yep. And that's the, the statistic world has decided that that's the number for statistical significance is a one out of 20 chance. In okay. this case, our P number is uh, 0 0.008. So it's like one out of 250. Right. Yep. Uh, it's, so this is, this is like really statistically significant <laughs> difference. And the difference, you go back up to the mean, is a 0 0.11 increase in orders, uh, which, in, which lays out to a $14.80 in increase in spend. And right. then if you apply a 50% product margin and a 13% um, uh, pick pack ship uh, yeah. Yeah. cost. You get down. It's about a little over five dollars uh, a profit, uh, right? That you get by mailing bounce back catalogs. Right. Yeah, that makes okay. it's good. Uh, Linda, you got any questions on this? No, sorry about that. Nope, you're good. <laughs> this, okay. This looks, so, like, this looks like a blood test. Actually, all these numbers here. <laughs> yeah, except this isn't bloody. The the, uh, the the earlier one on the advertising was bloody. This is actually <laughs> this is <Yeah>. green. <laughs> oh, like this is good. Just the 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 numbers look like something I read from my doctor, but this is better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that that same we use the exact same format in all the rest of these slides. So once once you understand how that flows, the rest of these will will make a lot more sense now. Mm -hmm. So this is bounce back catalogs. If we go to the next slide. Um, we, I took it down a layer and looked at, okay, does it vary by channel? Uh, yeah. So in, what we find is, so Amazon on the left, uh, if you go down and you look at the P number, it's 0.663. Yeah. Right. So that's way higher than 0 0.05. Yeah. So that means there's not a statistically significant difference in the Amazon orders. Yeah. <clears throat> So bounce back catalogs didn't work with Amazon. Right. Uh, if you go over to the web and you look at the P, you get 0 0.003, which is again, way less than 0 0.05. Yeah. So the, and then on phones, phones was like Amazon. Phones didn't show uh, a statistical significance. So the only place that we saw a statistic, statistically significant difference was on the web orders. Yeah. And yeah. so as you're sitting there trying to figure out which one, where you want to spend your money, uh yeah. our recommendation is put a bounce back in every web order but don't yeah. put them yeah. bounce back in amazon and phone orders phone orders well, one thing i looked at this a little earlier um that didn't quite make sense to me was well first of all one suggestion on the chart here is on the previous slide you did the control group on the left and the test on the right and you flipped it on this one so that just to make it you know easier to read from page to page right that's a good point yeah, you're yeah. Right. Just uh, I looked at it backwards when I first got here and thinking, wait a minute. But then I, then I got yeah. it. So, um, yeah, that's good feedback. What was, what was surprising to me was um, the Amazon, the mean number of orders in both groups, 1.8, 1.74, is quite a bit higher than the web orders. And so that just was just kind of counterintuitive to what I understand about Amazon customers being lower uh, retention, you know, so that, that, that jumped out as kind of odd looking, but. Yeah. And you, we might can go back and look there, there. So let me, uh, let me add a little bit more color to this. Um, when we first did this and when we first sent you on the initial findings report, we said we yeah. weren't finding a statistically significant difference. Mm -hmm. The problem that had occurred was there were some customers in there that were doing 10 16 there was a customer that did like 16 orders oh and sometimes they were in the bounce back group mm -hmm. and sometimes they were in the holdout group so yeah. they were showing up in both uh 
both the test and control groups. Mm -hmm. And these were customers that had made a lot of orders and spent a lot of money. So that's mm -hmm. what that was what was clouding the uh, the initial thing when we because so as I was digging through the data trying to figure out you know why because it was a counterintuitive result, right? The bounce backs wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so there were 40 of those orders. I took those 40 out. Uh, there are a large number of customers that have made uh, orders like eight, 10, six. Um, and so here in the Amazon orders, you see there's only, there's 291 and 87. Oh, it's a small number, yeah. It's a smaller number than the observations over in the web. Mm -hmm. So there could be something going on there where it just some of mm -hmm. these, it's a handful of Amazon customers that are skewing the mean. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's maybe why your your uh, P number, your P test, or what is it called? The, yep. the point six six three. Yep. There's a lot P of value. noise. Mm -hmm. Yep. That could so be. I'm I'm surprised that you said that there were customers um, that showed up in the test and the control. We yeah. would have eliminated anybody that had ever gotten a catalog. So I don't know how they could have been in the bounce back twice, unless that's not what you were saying. What I'm saying is that when they made an order, so this, let's say a customer made 10 orders. I think what happened was every time we were applying the algorithm of put them in the bounce back or put them in the holdout, but we didn't maintain that state across. We, we were doing that at the individual order level, not at the customer ID level. So we didn't put customers into holdout and test. We put orders into holdout and test. Uh, I thought we intended to do customers. Yes, I thought so as well. That's why I need to go back and look at that. Okay. Because the bottom line was is that, you know, no customer should have ever gotten, and maybe this isn't what you're saying, but no customer should have ever gotten two bounce backs. Uh, I think there were customers that got two bounce backs. I can go back and look, but there were definitely customers that both got a bounce back and were flagged as a holdout. And that I can believe because part of the algorithm was if they ever got a catalog, they should not even be part of this test because this was to be a test for new customers. Right, Rob? People that hadn't gotten a, a catalog. Um, I'm it pretty was sure. Well, so, I don't remember if we limited it to that or I don't remember how we, we have, did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were not, if they ever got a bounce back or if they ever got mailed a catalog, they should not have been eligible for another bounce back. I I'm don't remember. Sure. I'd have mm -hmm. to look. Yeah, yeah so there are customers that got multiple bounce backs. And there are customers in this case that were both flagged as got a bounce back and are part of the holdout group. And those are mutually exclusive Venn diagrams. They and you see in both of those. And did you end up just throwing those out from the final analysis? Correct. I took those 40 out. So it's only 40. Okay. Right. Yeah. Do you still have those 40? Because I'd like those yeah. names. I, yeah. I got the kept... customer IDs. Yeah. For those. Yep. I'll, get, I'll send you that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because what, what our whole point was is the thought was if they ever were mailed a catalog, we didn't want to send them another one. These were what? for what we thought were new customers. But right. why would we do, why would we do that? I mean, why wouldn't we just send? I thought we were testing the uh, you know the efficacy of a bounce back, just period. I thought we landed. I know we had a, a rule in place that 
they wouldn't get a bounce back if these things happened. But I thought we I thought we figured out that no, I know what it was. Um, if they were a prospect and they placed their first order, let's say in the October catalog, they could be in the bounce back group because that was a new customer, so they would have gotten the catalog. I think that's what we landed right. on. So uh, on, on our to-do list, yeah. <laughs> yeah. we all need yeah. to sit around and figure out what's up. I could tell you what the data shows, and then we could go mm -hmm. back and figure out, you know, yep. why is, you know, why some of these anomalies are showing up in the data. Okay, it might yeah. be that we set it up that way, or it might be just be we didn't we didn't execute what we thought we were executing. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll I'll write it down as a takeaway and follow up. And I haven't been through any of this with Nick, uh, so he, he hasn't seen any of this. So, you know, we need to follow up on that. Okay, yeah, next slide. Invite, but it'd be a little late for him. Yeah, it's 3 a.m. there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, because if there was phone customers, you said you looked at phone customers too, and they performed like Amazon. So phone customers probably got a catalog before to place the first order. Oh, guessing. that's a good point. Yeah. So I think, I think we have like a hybrid lend of what, what what you just said and what what we, we ended up doing. Yep. Oh uh, look. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh this is the thank you cards. Uh same thing. Uh so this time the holdout group's on the left and customers receiving the cards on the right. Um and uh there's little difference between the two and mm -hmm. it's not statistically significant. So it didn't look like holdout cards uh, worked, and, and that was true across every one of the channels. There, there was not a channel that holdout cards worked on. Uh, I, we don't know, could there be an effect on retention next year with customers that you send a thank you card to, and now they feel good about you and they'll come back next year, but mm -hmm. it definitely didn't have an impact on their Q4 order behavior. Okay. As, as opposed to the bounce backs. The bounce backs did have an effect, thank mm -hmm. you cards. Well, and if you just look at the web bounce backs, it was even better than your total test. It was like 0.13 instead of 0.11. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Yeah, actually, it was interesting. Is we just talking about the thank you cards? Uh, I actually thought the thank you cards. It was going to be a question of was it worth the two dollars or three dollars that you were spending for thank you card? Yeah. Uh, but it didn't even get to that level of. It just, right. It just didn't work. Um. So then, uh, Rob, you had asked as I was taking you through some of this um, earlier uh, after the initial uh, report. Um, you know, when you go back to that original slide, it showed that if you were a Fair Indigo customer, your behavior was different uh, mm -hmm. than the channel average. And so I dug in on both the bounce backs and the thank you cards to see if you were a Fair Indigo buyer on Amazon, right? Was your behavior different? And what we found uh, from bounce backs is it's a bad p-value, so there's no statistical significant difference on if you were ordering Fair Indigo versus people that were ordering either Jubal's or or the other brands. Uh, in the thank you cards, it also shows that it's no significant difference. But the problem with thank you cards is there were only 25 total uh, observations that met those criteria mm -hmm. of buying a Fair Indigo order on Amazon and getting a thank you card. Hmm. or being in the holdout group. It was just, it was, it, the, the universe got too small. Mm -hmm. So if we want to look at that, you know, we'd need to go back and test uh, against that smaller segment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay, next slide. And I am done with those, and I'm going to turn it over now to Brian. Great. Thanks, Bill. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few slides uh, of the findings where we try to look for patterns in the in the data. Initially, we took a look at the sales data. I'm sure this likely isn't surprising to you. Um, majority of your sales occur in fourth quarter. What we thought was pretty interesting is those seem to peak in November and then drop a little bit in December. Um, by channel, they seem to follow the same, roughly the same seasonality pattern. And as you can see here, your, you know, your web orders are certainly bringing in the most dollars for you right now. Again, yeah. 
the, the two things I noticed here were one is <clears throat> how we got sort of blindsided at the very end of this last year. Um, I built the sales forecast off of the 2016 pattern. So we dropped in November from 242 to 237, just a little bit. So um, the the days, the Thanksgiving, Cyber Monday, all those days kind of lined up in 16 and 17 pretty close. Mm -hmm. So I, we dropped in in the first, first uh, two weeks of December a lot more than I had planned us to. Um, so that one looks more like 2015, but 2015 was kind of a weird calendar because if I remember Cyber Monday actually fell in December, uh, sorry, Thanksgiving was l less of the Thanksgiving weekend stuff went into December. So um, I think that's why that drop was a little sharper there. But this last, the last two years were kind of the same, same pattern. So that was a big drop. And then the other thing is even though our Amazon business has grown, from year to year, um, the peak in the Q4 is less and less. Um, hmm. So we're relying on Amazon less in Q4 than we were a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, that is a, absolutely correlated to the gift brands. The So the non-fair indigo brands that we carry are really petering out more in the fourth quarter as um, other sellers come online with them and sell them at Amazon. So. Amazon's turning more into an, a 12-month a business. Uh, still big peaks, of course, but not not quite as big as they were. Yeah, that's interesting. So you see that here too, right? So you see yeah. Amazon exceed the other channels sort of in that third quarter-ish right. time frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then the phone just peaked. The phone just continues to kind of dwindle. Yeah, so we got We've got that on the next slide. Right. So that's that's the trend you're seeing that you're mentioning. So again, just looking, you know, aggregating it over a year to look for trends, take out the seasonality. Um, yeah, exactly what you were just talking about. Web still seems to be, you know, your kind of fastest growing channel. Amazon's, you can argue maybe Amazon is starting to catch up as far as a growth rate, but you're still I would say a web focused company based on these numbers. Yeah, I mean actually in 2015 Amazon and Fairneo were pretty and web, I mean we're pretty close. Um but they I think we pulled away a bit there on the web. Mm -hmm. And and one thing about this uh the 2015 numbers here started in half June. Year. Right. Yeah, half a yeah, year of 2015. Yeah. That's a good point. That was only half year, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Otherwise that looked really good. <laughs> Yeah, I love that growth rate. Well, yeah. Yeah. I don't like that starting point though. When I first saw that, I'm like, oh man, we're doing pretty good. Yeah, that's a good point. So I should, oh, yeah. I should that double cool. that. Yeah. Just to make the, uh -huh. not artificially inflate the uh, rate of change. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, moving on. So in the time series data, we looked at it and really didn't seem to be any surprises other than what you pointed out, Rob, where maybe Amazon is starting to be more of a consistent throughout the year, or maybe at least at the second half of the year versus so focused on fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. um, so we moved into a classification model. So this was interesting. Um, we utilized all the customer data only for customers that had received catalogs since that's what we were trying to predict is if we send them a catalog will they order uh -huh. um tried a bunch of different methods i won't go into all the gory details of that um but we ended up with two that were over 90 percent which is highly unusual and yeah. highly suspect highly suspect and still uh somewhat hotly debated amongst the team <laughs> I really want these numbers to be accurate. <laughs> well, I don't want to buy 90, but I'd like to at least come up with something that's better <laughs> and and believable. Um, so anyhow, we did we went through, um, did all the coding, came up with these numbers, um, went back, had other. I did a lot of the coding. I, the rest of the team went back and looked and tried to figure out if I messed something up somewhere. Nothing popped out. Um, 
Hmm. So really our suspicion now is that there's some non, non, non obvious contamination where somehow the, the values we're using for our test and predicting fourth quarter, our, our test and training, and then predicting fourth quarter, somehow there's not a clear cut there. So we're actually using the predictor variables or what we're trying to predict in building the model, which is always going to be really great if you can see the future, right? And then we end up with this sort of inflated result. Uh -huh. um, we didn't unfortunately have time to go back and get a, a cleaner cut data set where I think Bill's working on that. Yeah, let, so me, that let me add, let me add something to that. So Rob, we went back and uh, we, we were going to have Nick rerun the data yeah. um, and slice everything off as of the end of Q3. Yeah. Um, right. And, but Nick was uh, over in India and was traveling back to Bulgaria. So I mm -hmm. said, Hey, we can just do it when he gets back. Right. So I was just um, surprised the end number is 2909. So that's small compared to the number of catalogs we mailed. So is yeah, so that a subset? Yeah, it's just a subset. So what we do is we build the model with a training set, which is one okay. subset. And then we hold out, like you guys do for your hypothesis testing, we hold out some of the observations and mm -hmm. then we test, test the model against that holdout set. Okay. So those holdouts that had 2,909. Okay. The, the total uh, amount we were working with was like 11,000, 12,000? Okay. Uh, yeah, it yeah, was like a 9,000. Yeah, it was like a 9,000 training set and then a like, 3,000 test yeah, it set. Was like, it's like 12,000, 12, yeah, something like that. Well, the test set is what you, you sort of blinded yourself to, the, to what they actually did and you tested it. <laughs> Nine, 9,000 results, see if we could predict the other 3,000. Exactly. Right. So what okay. you do is on the on the 9,000, you sit there and you say, we know these variables and here's the outcome that they bought or didn't buy in Q4. Mm -hmm. And so the model's sitting there saying, okay, we know that if this happens, this this output happens over here. Mm -hmm. And then when we go to the test set, we take the out, they, they don't get to see the output. They just get to right. see the things that are happening over here up until Q4. And then they have it has to predict what happens in Q4, right. and then we compare that prediction to what the actual thing that happened was. Yeah. Okay. And what you're seeing in this little chart off to the right is you see what we predicted in the columns, and then what actually happened was in the rows, and right. we're getting a 95% prediction accuracy. Right. And Which and that true. means yeah. like in this case, if you just look at the the order column. Yeah, we would have just mailed our, our model would have said just mail the people that we think are going to order. Uh -huh. And so you would have gotten an 80 percent response rate. Oh. Off right. Of that. <laughs> right. That's what I said. When yeah, it would be, great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it would be yeah. great if that was true. But huh. so so that's why we don't believe that our, uh -huh. there's something contaminating the data. There's something where. In the test group, in the model, we actually mm -hmm. the test group stuff kind of somewhere contaminated the, the training. The I mean, this is, this is the same kind of modeling like um, the prospect co-ops would kind of do, right? Exactly. Exactly. So the this, same. Is not, this is nothing like just off of the press at Northwestern University model thing. We are wildly <laughs> intelligent. Okay. <laughs> Very good, and Brian has a new hot machine with yeah. huge processors. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. we're using the same textbooks that everybody else is. Yeah. So, I mean, the only maybe the novel found part. something new, but probably not. Probably it's right. an error someplace. Some some of us are more hopeful to actually find something new and useful. Yeah. The. Uh, <laughs> I think there's still that opportunity. We can, you know, work on that post this project and uh -huh. see 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 what that may be. Um, yeah, principal component analysis. So the unique thing for me is we're using versus your prospect data. Is this is your customer data, right? Right. So uh -huh. 
it wouldn't surprise me if it's at least a little better, you know, sure. that we're a little better at predicting repeat customers versus cold oh, yeah. customers, right? Well, but we usually give them our historical data as well. We, Don't you we give do. them yeah. right? Yeah. So they get our data or a subset of our data when they look to right. do the prospecting. Right. So, uh, but they're still plucking off a different universe of people that don't have yeah. any history with us. So Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, the so, only um other thing I uh wanted to call out, I don't know if there's anything you can do about it or look at, but the the average day between orders is the biggest, the most important predicting variable, right? Yep. Um, so I wonder in that if there's any interaction with returns. So mm. probably a common reorder is I ordered a size large and I really need a medium. So I return the large and get the medium like a week later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if or how that would play into or if that's just baked into everything um so so we had out. returns returns data was in the uh data set right so if you look at the classification oh, yeah. yeah you'll see down at the bottom you see dollars returns i think we also right. have number of items returned right uh, number of returns right. yeah number of and returns and dollars that they yeah yeah oh. so that that sh the model should be if it it should be incorporating that information in but yeah that's a really good point yeah just uh, the one okay. way to test that or to look at that more deeply would be the the pattern for so there's skews for sales and skews for returns and then the way we set up our skews there's like a parent skew and a child skew the parent is like the style she ordered okay. and, the, and the child is the color size combo so if she returned if she returned a SKU and replaced it with a different SKU that had the same parent number, that would indicate a return replacement. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. All right. That makes sense. And then one other point. So the I, I'm just showing a uh, sort of the top a cut of variables. So they're in this principal component analysis. We actually utilize 21 oh. different variables. Mm. Um, so this is. These are the most influential, and then okay. we also included, we also included the others. Um, there was, without going into the, there was marginal improvement each time you included more components. Mm. So, um, and one of the reasons for doing that is an experiment. Maybe we can try is if we have your prospect data, can we match these that up to any of the variables? Mm. And sort of, sort of see if we can do internally as good as the data you're at, you're buying now. Mm -hmm. So that must mean that some of the variables below are zip code oriented or demographic oriented. <laughs> there was uh, states ended up being in there. Because um, those are the only variables you could really use with prospect data, right? Would be the external data. That's right. So it was a lot of demographic. There was the Hispanic, white, black. Mm -hmm. Uh, average income, house house value, all those were were actually in the model, but with these that set of variables, they didn't weigh heavily. Mm -hmm. But if we took out these top ones because they're prospects and we don't have that, mm -hmm. um, anyhow, just a thought, something we yeah. could try. And I don't know, Bill. Bill and I have been going back and forth, and the rest of the team about other things we'd like to try. <laughs> And one thing um, for uh, Rob and Linda, just so you know, uh, what I want to do is when I'm, I'm over in Bulgaria, I, I think I want to sit down with Zlatka in, yeah. on my next trip and have this be mine and Zlatka's project, is to figure out what's in the data and then run models. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then the last model we built was a sales prediction model. So we took just the subset of customers who actually placed an order. And, and again, those were just catalog customers and uh, used a pretty extensive algorithm to do some selection for a linear model. Um, what you see is what you get here on the slide. 
The variables included were, as you probably are not surprised, sales dollars, value of orders, and again, average days between orders. Um, the model, again, taking you know that holdout set and comparing it against what we got out of the test set model, or uh, I'm sorry, training set model versus the test. Uh, it seemed to do okay, sort of in the zero to $200 range. Um, as you proceeded up and beyond that, you got a lot more deviation from the red line. The red line, if everything was perfect, if our predictions were all perfect, all the dots would be on the red line. Mm -hmm. So you can see it kind of fanning out as you go to the right to the higher dollar values. Um, again, we think the right variables are in there, uh, but there are some other things we could explore for some generalized linear models that will essentially, instead of treating this as one whole set of data, it'll start looking at different regions of the data and start to make correlations along those regions where we may be able to pull in sort of those high dollar values that are currently way off the, the predictive line, closer to that predictive line. So that would be things like splines and ridge regression and k nearest neighbors, all things I'm sure your president would be happy to do for you upon completion of his degree. <laughs> um, once you came up with a uh, validated are you selected what you think the best model is? Obviously, you know, we'd move into doing some type of validation where potentially applying this to your future sales and then seeing how that works again. Okay. So, so would maybe. you kind of use these two models in tandem with each other? Is that kind of, so you would, the first yeah. model is who to mail to and the, this model is predicting right. the sales that each one will generate? Right, so you sort of come up with, that's exactly right. So uh -huh. you do the first model, you say, here's a probability of getting a sale from this customer. And then based on the this model, the sales prediction model, you'd come up with a value. By multiplying the two, you kind of come up with a risk adjusted customer value, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. So it's probability of placing an order and what we think their order value will be. Mm -hmm. And then you come up with a score for all your customers. Oh yeah, that's right, okay. So yeah, op optimally you, you use these in parallel or sort of actually in sequence really. Rob, you'll hear people like Dave Johnson, they'll talk about uh, you know how far down into the file to right. mail and right. stuff like yeah. that. So what you do is you take these scores and you just rank order everybody. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear, you know, you, you'll mail to the most probable one, the second most, and then the question mm -hmm. becomes how far down in the file you mail. And mm -hmm. then you'll also hear him talk about the deciles. So they'll mm -hmm. split it. So you got the top 10%, next 10%, bottom 10%. And if you start cutting back on your circulation, you start mm -hmm. whacking from the bottom and whack your way up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So that is off the models. Any questions on the models before we move into the dashboard? Mm -hmm. Okay. Frank, I will turn it over to you. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me all right? Yep. Yes. Good. Okay, great. Yep. Uh, I'm going to take you through the um, some of the data analysis we did in the, the dashboards. And we use a software package called Tableau. I put in there the um, Gartner's Magic Quadrant, and you'll see Tableau's up top right in the Magic Quadrant, really nice next to Microsoft. And um, Visually, I mean, I think it's a great software package. I'm not trying to sell it to you, but uh, we did do the tutorial. There's a couple of different ways of learning Tableau. Um, they On their website, they have a couple of nice videos, and they're segmented out in four or five minute segments. So if you want to learn how to load a file, you watch that video. If you want to learn how to do linear models, you could do that in there. If you want to do forecasting, there's another little video on that. That's a really easy to use software package for data visualization. That's what we're going to demonstrate today. Um, there's a couple different ways of um, you know purchasing the software you could have on your desktop, which is the, what we have for, uh, we got our license through um, Northwestern for a student, you get a one year package. Uh, you could hook it up through your server, online. Uh, there's multiple different ways that they recommend online. I know um, I think it's Jack Daniels is using them for some of the presentations. They have some nice videos online. The Texas Rangers are using them for their data visualization. 
Um, but again, you could use it one or two people on your company, or you could have it roll out across everybody. Again, I'm not trying to sell it, just trying to explain it. So, Brian, if I share my desktop, is that so what I do? Share your screen? I'm going to stop and then I'll let you start. Okay. All right. So I'm done. You should be able to take over. All right. So, hopefully, I picked the right tableau. So, can you guys see my screen all right? Tableau? Yep. Yep. Yes. 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 Okay. So the, the first place I want to start is the uh, data setup. So what we did is we pulled in a CSV file that uh, Brian went in and cleaned up and you know took uh, took out some of the data that was missing, added some other data in. So cleaned it up and it was really simple. It's just you know a simple formula where you you go in and you just load the data. That's the first step. And in here you can you know, adjust the data, you could change the zip. If it's in character, you could change it to numeric, you could change the names of the city, move it around and, and play with the data. Um, the next thing is to start building, you know, the different models. And it was really cool when we pulled this one up, you know, it's a state, uh, you know, where the sales are per state. And the way we, we coded this is um, green is the highest volume and dark red is the lowest volume. And if you're presenting, can you guys see the, the little, um, text box that comes up with it. So Wyoming's had about the yep. fourth quarter, $2,386 of sales. California is the largest, 144. You know, New York's another high one. Again, these are some of the areas with the higher populations, but they also hire customers. And one of the, the nice things is you can, you know, zoom in. I mean, as you get closer in, you could even put, I left it at the state level. You'll see in a second, I have it also by the, um, the city where the, the, the orders came from. Mm -hmm. So again, just a nice way to, to visually display it um, where it is within there. The other thing we're trying to do in, in this series of um, slides is really around, or dashboards is around the clustering or you know where your customers are. Uh, we talked about we, we bumped this, the, the data up with the census data, and along the y-axis here you'll see the the dollars sales for the fourth quarter. And then based on percentage of the population that we're sold to. So we've got the, the, the black population, the Asian population, the Hispanic, and the white population. And again, just easy editing here. You can edit the access. It automatically gives you an access, but you could do a, a fixed one to get a little more visualization on what, what the data is. So if you put 800 in there, it, it'll make a little more clear the downward trend of the data for the first three categories and then the upward trend um, in the last category. Another thing that I did um, was I wanted to put in by um, household income. So it's easy. You just grab the household income field over here on the left. Or is it income per household? And you dump it in the color and it'll color code it. Again, the initial one, because it shows you all the data, uh, there's this one data point that's stretching it. So if you go in there and edit the access to about 1,500, um, you'll, you'll see the data more clearly. And again, this is something that, you know, if you're doing presentations, um, it really kind of shows where the dollars are by household, by um, the different demographics. <clears throat> Same thing on the, um, again, Y-axis is dollars fourth quarter, and then I looked at the median age. You know, it's a little difficult here. You can kind of see a, a little hump, but again, as you fine-tune the axis here, to, um, move it down a little more, you can see again where the clustering of the data starts showing up. So again, data here is around 32 to you know 48, 49 years of age is kind of the, the median cluster for the age of the people who bought stuff in the fourth quarter. Sales by income, just uh, again a quick visual. This is uh, per household income, so people making 40,000, 60,000, 80,000 represent about 80. I think it's 76 percent of your your customer base. A little up over 100,000, 20,000 is a smaller. 120, so your sweet spot would really be around this 40 to 80,000 um, income level. Um, now I got to switch screens to the other. Any changes on the clustering before I go to the time series data? Um, nope. So I need to 
stop sharing that. One, one th thing while Frank's switching over, uh, that age data comes from yeah. the census. Uh, so we're looking at, at zip codes and then looking at the average age within zip codes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Are you guys seeing uh, Tableau again, the time series data? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Great. Um, so again, what this is, let me move this, uh, so the, the chart that Brian showed before, you know, it's easy if you click on the, the individual revenue streams, Amazon it highlights it and kind of grays out the other ones. Um, so phone volumes, again, you can see the, the humps here. And we talked a little bit about how Amazon had a decreasing uh, fourth quarter. Same thing with phone orders. Seems like it decreased um, compared to the previous two years. Um, this is just more, you know, monthly or uh, the daily sales. So this was the month of December. And one of the things that was nice is um, with the data visualization, you could see pretty quickly the phone orders are pretty, pretty um, obvious. And you know, again, this is something where again. If you're operating a call center, maybe this time next year you, you hold back, you know, staff as many. But you know, over here in the beginning of the month, you need a higher staff to manage the phone order volumes. Again, assuming that the um, process is repeatable from year to year, and the web volume as well. But again, the, the nice thing with Tableau is it's it kind of highlights that pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, this is the state map by um, city. And again, what I liked on this one was, again, I used to manage a call center, so I always look at the phone stuff. You know, if you're looking to try and, you know, schedule your, your phone staff when they're going to be available, you do it mostly on East Coast, you know, Central Time Zone, Mountain, or, you know, West Coast, Pacific Time. Um, just a, a quick idea and our visual to see where are the calls coming from. Again, so it took, you know, two minutes to pull in. These are the... The, the rows, the latitude for where the, the city is, longitude, and then the month with the order volume. So being able to pull all that information and to lay it on a nice map. So can I ask a question? So on the map, does the map go down to county and zip code? Yep, you, you could put it down to the zip code. I think I have it here to the city level. Um, yes, yeah, this is city level. Bill, I'm uh, thinking more two men in a truck. Yeah, and that's that's actually on my uh, to-do list is yep. uh, dump that stuff into here. Yep. Yeah, Zlaka did some, but uh, this is it's this not is as, no, this is slicker. Uh, well, yeah, hers is a lot of coding. The other thing I'll show you is the, um, before we get to the final dashboard, this is just the um, order volume. I mean, the catalog submissions or number of catalogs sent, the number of postcards sent. You'll see the year over year. The top part is 2016, the bottom part is 2017. So you can see the, um, the decrease in the year over year um, numbers of catalogs sent. You know, postcards, I think you started in, was it September, October? Um, I think we sent a couple in September. Mm -hmm. um, five of them or so, um, and then the, the 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 one that I really like is this you know sales dashboard. So it's probably a little small on your screen, um, but what this is meant to do is really to show um, four different graphs that are dynamic. That if you click one of the fields over here, Amazon um, actual orders, you'll see the actual just the Amazon, and it pulls up and all the graphs that it's applicable for. Um, the other thing I also did down here on the month over month was I forecasted out the year. Again, that was a simple, you don't need to really do modeling for that. It's just a, an option to, let's see, let me get back out, here it is. So these lighter shade ones are the 12 month forecast. You'll see it'll pick up the seasonality in October, November, and December. But it does that with a, a simple um, click of just, you know, kind of the forecast out. There's different models you could put in there. But all you're doing is saying model out the next 12 months. You put the period you want, and it, uh, it'll figure it out for you using statistical models. This is forecasting for 2018? Yes. Okay. So we've got 15, 16, 17, and this is uh, 2018. So what model is that using for 2018? 
to it was a time series model um, taking into consideration the seasonality. Uh, Is it a Rima? Frank? <clears throat> um, I'm trying to see where I. Um, it's in here somewhere. So. Um, can't remember where I edited it at. Rob, one of the so when you're doing a time series um, forecast, the the model goes in and looks at historical data and figures out do you have a seasonal component that comes mm -hmm. in, and it'll it, a lot of times you'll hear things talk about seasonally adjusted models, mm -hmm. right? And so it does that. It goes in and figures out the seasonality. Okay. And then once it pulls that out, it then looks at what's your trend over time, yeah. not including the seasonality, and then okay. forecasts that trend out and puts the seasonality back in. So it's looking at 15 to 16, 16 to 17, Correct. and then seasonality within that. Okay. Exactly. All right. Yeah, I can't find it right now. Okay. No, that, that's that's all I that that's what I was wondering. I, there there's no customer data driving any of this obviously or circulation just data. historical and then right. knowledge <clears throat> of the seasons yeah right okay. strictly, strictly patterns yeah okay so that's our, our our big dashboard um this one was a sales dashboard again it shows where the you know the advertising is or the, the number of catalogs sent the postcards sent out kind of the map on where the locations are this is the daily for December. So if you're forecasting out or seeing sales and you got to know that, you know, we need to pick it up or um, and then the bottom is the month over month forecast for um, with the future year forecasted in there. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rob, if I could, and I don't know if you remember, but uh, when Zlatka and I won that contest, we were doing a time series model to forecast sales. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what we use, that mm -hmm. the same type of model. Okay. Any other questions on Tableau or the dashboard? No, it looks easy to use. Mm -hmm. Looks more functional than QuickSight. Oh, is, really? it, um, is it easy to, uh, so the visual is really great. Obviously, it's nice to look at a picture versus columns of numbers, but do they make it fairly easy to export to sort of slice and dice data the way you want it and then export it in, in columns versus, or is it really a visualization tool? Yeah, you um, can manipulate the data in here. You could slice it. You could pull out um, different mm -hmm. revenue streams. You could pull out um, different quarters. You could add attributes as well to it to, you know, reclassify some data. So if you want to say everything over five thousand dollars is a huge order, between mm -hmm. five, you know, two is a medium order, and then whatever or for the lower orders, you could do that as well in here in Tableau, and then use that as an attribute. Yeah, I think the my opinion, the downfall, if the downfall of Tableau is you have to start with clean data. Right. Putting, you know, dumping in a CSV and uh, trying to manipulate and clean up data in Tableau is not going to be fun. Mm -hmm. um, but, but like Frank was saying, once you have clean data in there, you can really, you know, slice it up however you want and export it mm -hmm. pretty easily. Okay. There's other questions, I'll hand it off to Sean, who'll take us through the mobile app. So, Sean, do you want me to pull the lead-in slide up, or do you have it? Yeah, that would be great. If you pull the lead-in slide, and then um, then I'll take I'll take control and drive. Yeah, I'll have to just switch it back to you then. Sure. Uh, oops. Apparently, it puts you back at the beginning. If it, oh, there we go. <laughs> Okay, there you go, Sean. Okay, great. So this is sort of the, the sizzle part of the presentation to a certain <laughs> extent. But um, so uh, first and foremost, why why build an, an app at all? Um, you know, we know that you know, Fair Indigo may use different um, you know, shipping vendors at the moment and so on. Uh, but we consider different types of approaches to incorporating technology into what we're doing. 
Um, and we thought it might be kind of interesting to incorporate technology into sort of the warehouse pick and pack process uh, to take advantage of real-time predictive information uh, regarding propensity to buy and to showcase how this technology could be incorporated um, to reduce costs um, and increase return on spend in, in real time. So sort of a POC. Um, in terms of our approach, we, uh, you know, we attempted, as you've heard earlier in the presentation, to score a fair indigo consumer's propensity to buy should they receive a bounce back catalog in their order. And as uh, our assumption is as a bounce back catalog has a hard cost, cost to it, and as not every fair and to go consumer will reorder, um, we wanted to try to deliver a technology um, which could best identify consumers most likely to buy after receiving a bounce back catalog with their order in almost in real time. Uh, rather than sending everyone uh, an order, uh, everyone a, a bounce back catalog. Um, in terms of the app itself and why incorporating an app into the approach as the technology, and as our models are deployed and can be recalibrated in real time, we thought that it would be really interesting for you know a, a, a sort of a, a warehouse employee to be able to scan existing barcodes on packages uh, on about to be shipped packages to receive a notification in real time um, if they should include a catalog or some other type of marketing material. So that was kind of this, the, the approach and the setup and why we thought it might be an interesting exercise and it incorporates the models that we're, that we're building with a, with a real time interaction component. Um, in terms of how the app itself was developed, the, the app was developed in Swift for uh, for iPhone and iOS technology. So it, it, the first the first phase for us was to develop the app for for an iPhone specifically, not Android phones and so on. Um, the really interesting piece from my perspective was including a, a real time Amazon database uh, called Firebase. And the advantages of this is we can directly integrate our models and the model output um, with the database and predictive scoring being able to be updated essentially in another application and pull automatically into the app without the app needing to update. So it's sort of a, a capability to, to really integrate in real time and run models, calibrate models, change them, um, and not have to redeploy and have people download an app a second time and so on. Um, so from that's sort of how we approached, you know, the premise, how we approached it, how we built it. Are there any questions about any of that before I show you sort of what it looks like and maybe a little bit about what, a little about the, how the database works and how it looks like? I think just jump in will be the best way. Classic. All right. Great. So let me try to share my screen. <clears throat> All right. I think you might be able to see my whole screen. Are you able to see that okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so this is uh, Amazon Firebase, and what you see here is just a, essentially sort of a formatted JSON, which is pretty cool, and it's a stripped-down, simplified version of some of the data in some of the files. And what's really nice is you're able to actually edit this either programmatically or directly in the web to set thresholds and boundaries and upper boundaries in this application here and it'll automatically pull in to the web app. So those CSVs that you saw earlier in the presentation are easily convertible to, to JSON and that JSON is, is directly integrated, integratable into uh, Firebase, which then pulls into the, the application. So the app itself looks like this. And the app, I should say, we went through the sort of full 
uh, full process of not only coding the app and 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 sort of testing it in a mock format, which is what you see here, but we deployed it to iTunes and it was fully downloadable and usable on an iPhone. So it's it's a rudimentary first step, but if you're curious to want to be able to do that, we could, we could show you how, how to actually go end to end and have the app on your phone. So in terms of the app itself, the user or the employee would pull up the app on, on their phone. This is the homepage that they would see. The first step they would take would be to, to click on scan. And here we've integrated two things, barcode scanning technology that act, takes advantage of iPhone camera technology directly. So it's a nice, easy light integration to be able to, to scan barcodes. The actual barcodes themselves, we can generate um, based on a, a list, your existing list of customer IDs, we're able to generate barcodes that can either be printed or scanned directly on screen and tied back to the the id so that's also a seamless integrated process so once you're on this page and you're able to click scan you click on you you uh you scan the actual barcode and once you've scanned the code what's happening here is the the app is actually detecting who that customer is by associating the code barcode to the id and which segment that customer falls in and the propensity to buy score that, that we've come up with per customer and indicating on the spot to that employee, should they be including a bounce back catalog or some other type of marketing material, for example, or not. And in this case, for this example, this particular person's score of 89.2 uh, exceeds the threshold of the dotted line here. So automatically the app is reading that score, understanding that that's above the threshold that we set in Firebase, which can be changed on the fly. And because that's the case, it's indicating green, good, you should ship, and in this case, uh, a fair and good back catalog. Um, if that customer score was below the threshold, the indication to, to the user of the app would be not to ship for that particular customer because their propensity to buy is not high enough should, for them to sort of deserve receiving or for the cost of carrying a catalog going out to them. So um, kind of in summary, the, the idea of this is, is of course, more of a P, you know, POC type technology to show and to showcase if you have predictive models that you, ha you, you have already in a, in a scoring mechanism that you calibrate and recalibrate and improve, you can easily interconnect those to IoT type devices and iPhone apps, for example, to bring in that intelligence in real time and to help uh, decision different actions that you may take on, on, a, on a warehouse floor, however, uh, however your choice with hardware happens to be. Um, so once you've done that as an employee, you're able to go back and scan again to your heart's content and you can end up back uh, in, and uh, continue to scan and, and then this will actually loop and, uh, and you're on your merry way sending sounds back catalogs. Any um, any questions or or uh, clarifications with the technology, the approach, how it was done? No, nope. I think it's it's cool. <laughs> yeah, I think the okay. I think the um, the brains of it would be really great. Um, and then then on the technology side, I think from a practical standpoint, I think you'd want to think about how you could integrate the predictor engine with like the existing pick and pack software versus just the iPhone. I and mean, the iPhone's really cool, um, but chances are the employees are gonna be, you know, getting some, some either a screen or a piece of paper that says what to put in the box. So ideally you'd want them to see what to put in the box the same place they're seeing what items to put in the box. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think the, the logic and the, like the real timeness and the ability to like crank it up or down the, the threshold. I think that's all really, really cool. Um, the technology, I'm I, only because I've worked in a warehouse, so I know <laughs> just trying to imagine 10 employees walking around with iPhones. With iPhones, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, dropping you know, cement floors and all that kind of stuff. So it's, I think there's just like some practical things around the actual device, but the, the thing itself is, I think, would be really valuable to companies. 
Right, so instead of just rotely sticking a catalog in every box. Right. Mm -hmm. Which in general is what we've done. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And and going into this, we, we knew that probably an iPhone is not going to be the most ideal way to do this in a warehouse environment, but we mm -hmm. more wanted to showcase the technology. Yeah. Well, the, the workers, the, the warehouse people would love it if we showed up and gave everybody an iPhone. <laughs> well, yeah. that's true. If we provided the, the iPhones and they could, yeah. And gave them a reason to actually carry them and use them and maybe not just for this application. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So let's see. So that's, that's it for me. So let's see if I stop sharing. I think it goes back to Brian. Yeah, I'll pick Did it up. That, that work? <clears throat> that work okay? I think Great. it's working. Great. Great. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. All right. So we're moving into the the wrap up. I'll hand it back to Bill. We're just going to kind of go through at a high level everything you've seen over the last stimulating hour and a half and uh, <laughs> recommendations to go with that. So we'll, uh, we'll we'll be quick on these because we've talked about all these uh, NPR radio sponsorship. And I wouldn't spend any more money on that. Uh, bounce back catalogs, definitely spend money on that. Uh, there are kind of two levels of the bounce back catalog. One is uh, just based on the test that you did, um, putting it in a, the box with the web uh, mm -hmm. orders will get you a lot of the value that you're going to get. And then taking it to the next level uh that uh sean was talking about where we build predictive models around people's response to a bounce back and mm -hmm. being able to integrate that in that'll even fine tune it even better um and then uh thank you postcards it didn't show any effectiveness now uh it could be that there's downstream effect in uh customer retention so this is this would be something to be worth looking at a year from now to mm -hmm. see if those customers that got thank you cards show any retention differences um i wouldn't spend any more money in the near term until you figure that out mm -hmm. uh the predictive models uh <laughs> put a lot of time effort and they're great mm -hmm. but we're going to go back with uh nicking zlatka and kind of pressure test these to to make sure that they are great i did mm -hmm. promise to share the bajillions of dollars that we will that we that will <laughs> come our way if these are accurate with my teammates um, uh -huh. yeah, <laughs> um, and then uh and then let's see do we got uh, five and six is there another slide here or is it these four oh, yeah sorry oh there you go yep yep there we go uh so software evaluations we showed you tableau uh we thought tableau was pretty, <laughs> it's pretty cool it's not cheap you know so we can play right. around with whether whether it's worth the with the bang um and then uh, the dashboard coming out of Tableau, a lot of things you can put in there. Uh, it, it could be uh, useful. Uh, you can put the, ta the dashboard up on a on an iPhone app too, which would be kind of a, an interesting thing. And then the the, the packaging app. Um, you're right about the uh, you know does it, are you necessarily going to have iPhones, but the the concept of what the packaging app does yeah. is, right. would be really useful. Yes. yes. Final questions. Um, the only other question I had about you, you, the bounce backs that looked like the web customers were the ones to focus on. And I just wondered if it would be worth any one level down. You know, it's, it's a profit of five, 548 per, per bounce back. Yep. What, you know, if half of, the, half of them are like $10 profit and half are like negative five profit, is there any other segment below where you went that would shed light on anything else that we could even further, you know, reduce the, the wasted ones. Yeah. What we didn't do. So there, so what I did was I went back to look at that. Was there statistically significant differences between the control group and the test group? Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what the next step on the bounce backs would be, and this, this was something that uh, Sean wanted the modeling team to be working on, but the modeling team was spending its time trying to figure out why its models were working too good. Um, hmm. So the, the, the next stage would have been to do modeling against bounce backs, right? So sit uh, there and say, let's take the universe of bounce back people out 
and run that same modeling algorithms mm -hmm. that we were running against all catalog buyers, but just looking yeah. at bounce backs. The mm -hmm. problem is because we weren't sure, you know, it, when you because we don't we we didn't believe the data that we were getting was mm -hmm. proven to be accurate. We didn't yeah. want to go and let's do bounce backs now mm -hmm. with the inaccurate right. data, but that, that's absolutely where we should go. Right. Plus your N number might have gotten too small to be significant with just bounce backs, I'm guessing. Uh, in the in the uh, comparison of two means that we were doing, potentially yeah. as you get to smaller clusters, if you're building the models, though, you're building the models on the whole thing. Oh yeah, um, yeah. it's a different technique. Yeah, yeah. We had 1750 bounce backs in fourth quarter. Uh huh. 1750. Okay. Not huge, but not not too small. Okay. We might be able to do something with that. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking this dive into our business. It's never been done to this level. <laughs> and we, we know what not to do. Um, and I think we know one thing to do. So yeah, we'll start there. Great. No, no. We appreciate you uh, letting us use your, your data. It was a much more fun project having you know, Bill with all of his background on board yeah. and being able to be the subject matter expert and actually working on data we knew or hopefully would provide some insight back to a, you know, a real business operation. So it was great. Well, we, we handed a mess of data over to Linda and Nick <laughs> to start with. So <laughs> it's no easy task to just clean the data before it gets to you guys. I know that it's, no. but I suppose that's pretty typical when you work with different platforms and systems, it's just, Right. Way to be. It's about 80% 80, 80 of the time is uh, typically just getting the data in a usable form. Especially from Amazon, where they don't require a first name or a last name or a state code or a whatever. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, well, okay. All right. Good luck with the finals. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Uh, Thanks. So Linda and Rob, if you're going to drop off, maybe we'll stay on the line for just a minute. Okay. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah. so you I'm going to stop recording. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to stop recording. All right.